Welcome to the Knowledge for Men show. Your life will never be the same. Your level of success will seldom exceed your level of personal development. I want to die empty of regret. I want to die empty of my best work. We don't understand who we are. Instead, we're living out somebody else's narrative. What one man can do, another man can do. If it's been done, it can be done again. Being yourself and being your truest, most authentic self in every moment. If it scares you or makes you a little afraid, do it. Follow your heart and your gut. The first stage. I think it's finding you, like finding out who I am today. Stuff will not work. You will have things that fail. Success is when you're a happy, fulfilled person. How do you define success? It's your life and you are the creator of the movie script that is your life story. Hey guys, I just launched my new book, The Dating Playbook for Men, a proven seven-step system to go from single to the woman of your dreams on Amazon now. It's currently ranked number three in the relationships category on Amazon. Inside this action-packed book, you'll learn how to deepen your masculine polarity to unleash the man within, how to build an awesome social life that women want to be around, how to understand what women want and desire, how to go out and meet women to build a mindset of abundance, how to go from getting her phone number to effortlessly setting up the first date, how to have a perfect first, second, and third date, and how to have happy and loving relationships and be the grounded man that she so badly wants. You can get the book now at knowledgeformen.com slash playbook. Or simply go to Amazon and search Dating Playbook for Men. You're going to like what you see. I guarantee it. All right, guys. Welcome to the show. I'm here with Rolf Potts. He's an author of two books, Vagabonding and Marco Polo Didn't Go There. He has reported for more than 60 countries for National Geographic, The New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, NPR, and The Travel Channel. Rolf, happy to have you here on the show. Happy to be here, Andrew. Thanks. All right. And so, Rolf, we dive in and start off every show with a favorite success quote or some sort of saying that the guest has lived by that's helped them on their journey. So share with us what you got and what that means to you. Well, I'll, I'll share with you, you might not get a lot of poetry, but I'll share with you a, a verse from Walt Whitman's Song of the Open Road, which has inspired me from a young age. It goes, uh, from this hour, I ordain myself loosed of limits and imaginary lines, going where I list, my own master, total and absolute, listening to others, considering well what they say, pausing, searching, receiving, contemplating, gently but with undeniable will, divesting myself of the holds that would hold me. And I think that's, um, that's a line that resonates at different times, at different time, uh, in different ways, at different times of your life. But the idea that you're not going to impose any limits or imaginary lines on yourself is important because it's not just a matter of finding the courage to say, go travel, which is a big part of my message, um, but also a matter of, uh, of what limits and delineates uh, a happy life. Uh, in, in the United States, there's often a, a monetary amount attached to happiness or to success. And you have people that are putting off doing what they really want to do because they want to make that first million or that first bit that makes them feel successful when in fact the truest form of wealth in my opinion is your time and it's not that hard to actualize your time wealth so um that's just one example of imaginary lines and limits that we place on ourselves and i think the first step towards getting out and, and actualizing your travel dreams or, or even just living a fuller life is, um, is, is throwing off those limits, is, is realizing that those imaginary lines are imaginary. And the second part of the, about that quote that I enjoy is that um, it's thoughtful. It's not just mindless rebellion against received wisdom, but it's pausing, searching, receiving, contemplating. It's you are... Um, you're going to be tactical. You're going to be uh, thoughtful and strategic in throwing off the imaginary lines and living the way that you really want to live. Yeah, so this is, this is a deep quote and I'm really interested in how you got started with this. Like how did you break through this type of societal conditioning? I think the common uh, excuse or question that you probably get about how you've traveled to, you know, I'm really interested in hearing about all these uh, places you've been to, or at least some of the stories uh, with the time we have. But I think the biggest excuse you probably get and correct me if I'm wrong, is, hey, I don't have the money to travel and, and I don't have the time. Hey, I've, I've got a mortgage. I'm, I got a full-time job. I mean, I only get 10 days off a year. Um, am I right about that? Those two excuses there? 
Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so how did you break through that? Like how, what happened in your life years ago when you just decided, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna travel. I'm, you know what? I'm, I'm not gonna just, uh, I'm gonna try a different path. Well, I think travel is something that I idealized since I was a kid, you know, like in the yearly cycle of months, the summer months when I wasn't going to school and I had a chance to travel to new places was the most exciting time of my life. And I grew up in the middle of the country in, in Kansas, and it wasn't like my family was taking me to exotic places. We were going to like um, Colorado or, or Kansas City. But even those small journeys were something that I really looked forward to. And I would look at maps and read books and, and just dream about getting out and realize that that might not, that, that plan isn't necessarily going to reward you. You know, my, my um, grandfather was a Kansas farmer and if anybody had earned his retirement, it was him. He'd been farming full time since he was about 15 years old. Um, but about the time he was old enough and secure enough to retire, his wife, my grandmother got Alzheimer's disease and he sort of had to stay in one county in Kansas for the rest of his life. Um, and which was really heartbreaking for me at the time, but it made me realize that life doesn't just reward you for working hard. You have to create your own space to actualize these dreams that, that occupy you. Um, I also remember the summer of my 20th year, I was working as a shelf stalker in a grocery store. And I realized I didn't really like the job, but I realized that any job that I had that I didn't like would be metaphorically similar to this mind-numbingly horrible job of putting canned peas and orange juice on a shelf in a grocery store. And so I sort of, I realized that I needed to, if I wanted to have, you know, this earth shattering, mind expanding travel experience, I would have to do it soon. So when I finished college, I got a job as a landscaper in suburban Seattle. I saved up what felt like a lot of money at the time. This is 20 years ago. I think it was like $6,000 or something, but gas was 99 cents a gallon. Uh, fixed up a van, traveled the United States and had this fantastic, fantastic uh, journey around the United States and, and, and Canada, around wow. North America. And what kind of, what kind of route did you, did you take this? This kind of reminds me of that, uh, that the movie and the book into the wild. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I've, I've joked to people that if, that if Christopher McCandless had read Vagabonding, he wouldn't have to go and disappear into the Alaskan wilderness, that there's other ways to, uh, to find your time wealth and to become rich in experience without being, you know, so extreme that you string yourself out. Um, I, and, and I, I don't think I was quite as focused on the wilderness as he was, but I started in Oregon and I went south because it was New Year's Day. And I just wanted to go someplace warm. And I sort of wanted to hit Mardi Gras in New Orleans when that was happening. I wanted to, that was a year out of college. So I wanted to hit spring break in Florida when that was happening. Um, and I just went uh, counterclockwise around the United States and hit about 38 states. And a lot of things happened by accident. I mean, I, uh, I ended up staying at a monastery in Massachusetts for several days. I did a police ride along in inner city Houston. Uh, I climbed mountains. I rafted whitewater. Uh, I met a ton of people. And I, and I always say that you can only travel, you know, the world when you're 23 once, by which I mean, I, I mean, I just had so much fun. I've been to more exotic places. I've had uh, more meaningful, in a way, adventures. But doing it for the first time when you're young is just so gratifying. And I realized that it was a lot cheaper than I thought it would be. It was a lot safer than I thought it would be. It was a lot easier than I thought it would be. And it didn't need to compromise the rest of my life. Uh, when I got back to see my friends on the tail end of that journey, which lasted a little less than a year, their lives incrementally hadn't changed that much. Their, you know, my prospects as a, a person of the employment realm hadn't been diminished. And I realized that this is something that I could replicate again and again over the course of my life. And in many ways, I'm still doing that. Um, I actually tried to write a book about that at the time. I failed miserably. It was, it was one of my best writing bits of writing education was uh, failing to write a book. Um, and I went over, I moved to Korea and taught English for a couple of years. And that taught me some more lessons about myself and about travel and living in other cultures. And it allowed me to save a lot of money. And it was during the two years of vagabonding around Asia and, and Europe after that 
uh, Korea experience that allowed me to transition into travel writing. And ever since, since my late 20s, I've, uh, I've, I've been a, a writer and at times a teacher full time. Got it, got it. And at what point did you write your first book, Vagabonding? It, it's a book I own as well. And uh, I'm, I'm, it, I read it and I'm just like, ah, I, I gotta travel the world. I gotta do this. Like I want, it makes me, it makes it just be, seem more real for me. Um, Vagabonding is a book that all the listeners, you, get, you can check out on Amazon. Um, at what point in your career did you write Vagabonding? Where have you, was it right after traveling in the United States or have you traveled the world at this time? Yeah, it was after after Korea. I started traveling the world in late 1998, and then I started, and then I, you know, I was writing f- for Salon and um, National Geographic Traveler and Connie Nast Traveler and some other magazines. Um, and I got that contract for vagabonding in which got off came off my website. This is before blogs. This was in 2001, um, and I finished it in 2002. So. Basically, and I wrote it in Thailand. I, I was technically still vagabond, and I hadn't kind of can't come home yet, and I technically didn't have a home. Uh, and so, in a way, it was the perfect time to write that book because I was still in the energy of that experience and still uh, really stoked and excited, and maybe most of all, grateful that I had been able to to actualize uh, that kind of experience. Yeah, and what you said, you learned some lessons about life, about travel and different cultures. What, what would you say were some of those big lessons that travel in general, traveling to six different continents and over 60 countries, what have you learned about life? What, what have you learned about travel and in different cultures? Well, you learn you learn what culture is and, and to an extent and you, you learn that you swim in your, your the pool of your own culture and that you can intellectualize culture, but... Um, until you're there experiencing it at a, at a gut level, then it's hard to really internalize what culture is. I mean, I read about Korea before I went there, but until I was in a place that where individualism is sort of a pejorative word, you know, as Americans, we really idealize individualism. In Korea, it's seen as a little bit of a betrayal of family and community. Um, and even linguistically, the Korean language comes with a different set of assumptions than perhaps English does. And so it was actually by making mistakes, by accidentally offending people and coming to these realizations of how deep culture goes that helped help me understand what culture is and help me appreciate uh, the similarities and the differences that we have. And then I think, I think travel in, in general helped deepen my understanding of what I've come to call time wealth, and which is the, the philosophy that underpins vagabonding. Vagabonding is about travel and making travel happen if that's what you want to do. But I think the big obstacle that people uh, need to overcome is the idea that what you really own in life is time. And if you're not spending your time in a way that enhances your life, then you should probably rethink the concept of time wealth. And it's something I think for each person, it's a little bit different. You're constantly refining it. But I, I came to realize that I would be in a place in, in Burma or Hungary or Egypt that I'd never heard of a week before. And I was just having this intense um, you know, moment of, of beauty or epiphany or hardship. And in a way, it sort of slowed time down. Like, like one, one week feels like a month when you're having so many new experiences uh, in a short amount of time. Um, and you know, I don't know if anybody is really uh, wired to travel indefinitely, you know, to travel for 20 years at a time. I think there's always going to be a balance between home life and your travel life. And I know people who, you know, their vagabonding exploits might last four to six weeks. Uh, whereas other people might spend two years on the road and, and, and until they scratch their travel itch. Uh, but I really think that travel is such a good metaphor for life and, and how to live richly that integrating, it into one's own life, depending on your tastes and how you how you decide to balance what you're doing at home, uh, is just a, a really good thing to 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 live life to your fullest. And you know, you mentioned earlier about getting time off and 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 finding the money to do this this sort of thing. Right, right. Um, I think that too is different with every people. You know, I've met people in, with high powered jobs like lawyers who will just, if they move from one firm to another, negotiate three months or six months or a year, leave into that. Um, I've met people, you know, everybody from park rangers to strippers who have sort of seasonal or sort of jobs that allow them to make a lot of money in a short amount of time. 
And they might work three months a year, six months a year, not in a big high status job where they're driving a sports car, but they don't need a sports car. You know, they, they, um, they live in beautiful parts of the world. They can work a few months and then travel for a long time after that. And so I think whatever situation you're in, um, you know, if you're middle class or above, um, then it's something that you can make happen in your own life. Again, it's, it's a matter of getting past those imaginary lines. Uh, oftentimes it involves quitting. I, I know people who have found that high powered, high paying job that they thought they wanted and it's just not making them happy. And so they might, they, they might just quit, travel, find something they're more passionate about uh, and get on with it. Uh, and so I think especially in the 21st century where we're no longer you know, having these cradle to grave professions where we never change jobs for 40 years and, and, and our job takes care of us, um, our skills are much more portable and we can move in and out of different professional endeavors. And really travel is, a, is something that will inform you, you know, if you travel in a smart way and you're not just sitting on a beach, you know, on the business end of a bong the whole time, you're going to be learning about the world in ways that will enhance your life professionally. Um, and so I encourage everybody within the specifics of their own calling and their own profession to find ways to live, uh, you know, in a more intense way um, and to travel if that's what they dream of doing. Yeah, yeah, this is good. I really like this concept of time is your biggest form of wealth. I, I mm. think when I, when I really think about that, because what's great about that is that we all have 24 hours in a day. We all have time. And uh, some of us use that time in different ways. And uh, it's, it's, it's just, we all have it. It's not like money where some of us just are born it, with it and some of us are born without it and we have to go and get it. Uh, but time is, it's, it's, it's like, it kind of gives us back that power. It's, it's like, we all have 24 hours in a day. How are you going to spend it? And uh, what I'm noticing about you is, uh, it seems like, you know, you're really following uh, your curiosity and your passions with traveling. And you wrote this book, Vagabonding, and um, another book, but it led you to writing for, uh, you know, the Travel Channel, um, NPR, the New York Times, and all these major publications. Did they just approach you? Were you just, do, were you just traveling and writing for yourself, your own blog and books, and these major publications approached you? Or, or did you actively pursue them? Most of the time I actively pursue them, but it's based upon the body of work that I've established. Um, when I, you know, I started travel writing before blogs were a thing, you know, blogs sort of came into their own in the political season of 2004. And I was, I was writing travel dispatches in 98, 99 for Salon, which back then had a, had a really great uh, travel department edited by Don George. It hasn't existed for more than a decade now. Um, but that was my entree into this world. In some situations, like Connie Nast Traveler, the editors approached me. You know, they identified something they liked in my writing and they came to me. And in fact, that's how I got the book Vagabonding, is that an editor at Random House, again, for blogs, saw my vagabonding philosophies, my time wealth philosophies on my personal website and said, hey, do you think there's a book in this? And, and obviously there was. Uh, so, um, yeah, but then, you know, as a, as a journalist, as a travel writer, just part of the business is pitching stories. And so once I had some salon stories under my belt and one of them appeared in Best American Travel Writing and some Connie Nast Traveler stories, then I could pitch National Geographic Traveler. Then I could pitch uh, the New York Times Magazine. Some, in some situations, like my New Yorker credit, um, I wrote a talk of the town piece, but it just seemed too complicated to pitch, so I just wrote the whole story and sent it to them. Uh, that's called writing on spec. And they picked it up. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. And so uh, I think the more you get into your career as a writer, the more likely people are to approach you. But there's always that business of generating new ideas, having new experiences, and approaching um, you know, the kinds of outlets and magazines that can help you get the word out and ideally pay you pretty well for it as well. That's yeah. That's just it's really great. It's fantastic when someone can really go on their own journey and path, and they start doing what they are really passionate about, and then in that process, be able to turn it into a career for themselves. I just find it like you know, if I wish more people would go in that direction. I think, um, I mean, in general, like, how do you feel about the work that you do? Well, uh, writing is is a, f a famously neurotic undertaking. I mean, it's 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 and especially travel writing. You're out in the world. You're having these amazing 
uh, immersive experiences, and then suddenly you're in a room with with your laptop, and you're trying to through words recreate this experience and communicate these ideas. Uh, and so, I like most writers have a love hate relationship with writing. Often, it's said that writers don't really love to write; they love having written. And um, in a way, that's part of the satisfaction of my career as a writer is that I have to struggle with almost every story or article or book that I write. There's a struggle and it goes through different periods of self-doubt and frustration. But the reward of writing and having written well is, is fantastic. It's part of why I love what I do. Um, and of course, you know, a lot of people ask me about travel writing because it sounds like such a great job. It sounds like a dream job. But um, and I offer a lot of information about travel writing on my website, but I try to dissuade people from thinking of it as a permanent vacation. You really have to love to write and love that hardship process of writing as well as loving to travel and, and, and make the sacrifices for it because there aren't a lot of large financial rewards. There's a lot of experiential rewards, but there aren't large financial rewards for this kind of profession. Uh, and in a way, I was lucky to get into travel writing when I did because there's even less money on an article-by-article by article basis for doing this. Um, so it's nice that, that I'm already established in that way. Yeah, yeah. So it's just the topic of time wealth. I really, I really, uh, I feel like that's a big takeaway for me here. Um, something I wanted to talk about too is uh, I noticed, you know, going through vagabonding. It seems like you're solo for much of your travels. Um, you know, can you talk about some of those, the, you know, the benefits of solo traveling and, and why more people should uh, go through that? Well, I've done it both ways. I travel with with friends sometimes, and I travel with solo travel solo sometimes as well. I prefer traveling solo because it just leaves you open to your environment in a way that you wouldn't otherwise uh, be open to. I mean, if you're traveling with an old friend, you might be bored at a bus station in Sumatra, but you'll be joking about somebody you knew back in college, right? Or if you're traveling with a girlfriend or something, then you might sort of have this interpersonal dynamic that is always going on while you're traveling through the world. And in the process, nothing against this, but in the process, sometimes you miss those opportunities that a little dash of loneliness or openness to other people um, might present for you. And so I've met just by traveling by myself and sort of being forced to find um, company, uh, I, just, I just have more interesting adventures. I'm also not beholden from the whims of another person. If I think, well, hey, you know, maybe I'm going to go to Singapore this week, but then I get stuck in the, the Isthmus of Kra in Thailand and I decide to spend a week in the jungle, then I can do that. I don't have to negotiate it with anybody else. This is something that um, works really well as a travel writer because... Uh, the best travel stories are about you know things and people beyond yourself and beyond the bubble that you bring with you. All of that said, I don't knock anybody for traveling with friends. You know, when I first traveled the United States, I was nervous about it, and so I traveled with various friends here and there. But since that first trip, now that I know how easy and enjoyable it is, um, I usually travel alone. Um, I'm also a fairly self-contained person. Some people, especially big extroverts, just don't like being alone that much. And so what I find is even if you start out alone, if you really, uh, there's so many people vagabonding at a given time that you can travel this week with a couple of German dudes you meet here and travel with a gal you met from California for a week here and then hang out in a village with some local people here and you don't really have to go in any one mode the whole time. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely. I just got back not not from a far trip, but San Francisco. I was with a friend, and everywhere we wanted to go, there was always this negotiation of like, all right, we're going to do this. Is that okay? And then you kind of have to make some sacrifices on the trip, uh, you know, because you're with a friend, and, and uh, you, you don't want to, <laughs> you know, burn any bridges there. Well, um, another thing I wanted to get into was. Uh, just, just a question. Like you've been traveling the world for quite some time. Did you notice any changes uh, in you being an American uh, when you were traveling pre nine eleven and uh, traveling post nine eleven? Uh, any did anything change for you? Uh, were, were people cultures looking at you differently? Not really. Um, and that might seem like a surprising answer, but I think the same Americans come up the same against the same idiosyncrasies uh, that they always have. You know, there, there's certain. Um, Stereotypes of American as Americans as big, fat, bellicose, ignorant people, you know. Um, and I think one uh, thing as as a traveler that's enjoyable is is going out there and representing your country as some, uh, you know, as as thoughtful, adventurous people. Um, interestingly, the people even after nine eleven, I was living in Thailand, riding vagabonding when nine eleven happened. 
uh, the people who seemed most been out of shape about American foreign, foreign policy were the people that you would expect, that you wouldn't necessarily expect. It's like British people um, and, and Canadians and, and Californians and, and, and just people who are very passionate about um, what they saw as failings of American foreign policy. Whereas uh, local people in everywhere from the Middle East to Southeast Asia were much better at discerning between you as an individual and, and you as a representative of your country's foreign policy. Mm. I think it's always I think it's always good to be aware of uh, you know the, the local political atmosphere as you go from place to place. But uh, one of the reasons why it's so sad to see for me why it's so sad to see all of the violence happening in Syria is that Syrians were just just completely awesome people. You know they were just really fantastic, really smart, generous, open hospitable and they were able to take interest you know america is a is a huge and complex country and so they were able to take interest in me um as a representative of that huge complex place without judging me based on a very small set of circumstances so i guess my advice to people who want to travel is that's another limit in imaginary lines by all by all means be careful you know and be and know which situations you should and shouldn't put yourself into. Like, don't go to Syria right now, for example. But um, know that on an individual level, people are people are good to you, you know. And 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 if there are some some bad eggs out there, there's ways to avoid them as well. Uh, and this this is something that you would never learn just by watching the headlines, you know. Um, I, I know people. There's nothing wrong with Western Europe and Australia and New Zealand, but people go there because it seems. America like it seems industrialized and friendly and it is but it's I mean you go to places like uh, Egypt or South Africa or Burma and you know people have time for you people are curious about you as an American and in a way I think of the reason why most of my long-term travels have happened in Asia is that well, first nobody would mistake me for an Asian I'm a big pale American guy uh, and that <laughs> That's an automatic cause for conversation. You know, it's like, hey, big pale American guy, what are you doing in our village? And then it becomes part of this conversation. And, and these conversations are, are as memorable as anything. They're as memorable as the, uh, as the mountains you climb and the, and the seas you dive as a traveler. Um, and, and it just becomes a part of your education. And, and, and again, it's one of those things, right? I met so many awesome people in Syria that God knows what they're up to now. It's, it's, it's really sad. But... Um, it, it allows me to understand the Syrian, Syrian situation with you know, just a lot more empathy and firsthand experience. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely see that. It seems like such a great gift. Oh, what, when you say that some of these uh, third world countries, um, and and I assume you're not you're not just in the in the tourist spots. Like you're going deep into the into these countries and getting the the raw cultures. It it may come across to some people as, as dangerous as, as, you know, you're putting yourself in harm's way. Um, you know, what had, you know, you've been, tra you've traveled quite a bit. Have you had any near crazy, li like life <laughs> threatening situations happen to you? Um, what has that experience been like? And also another thing that comes to mind is just kind of like medical care, like long-term, I know like four or six week travel, but like long-term travel, like how are you handling uh, the the kind of like when you get really sick and you're in a third world country? Oh, I'll, I'll answer that first and then I'll address the danger thing. Um, uh, uh, amazingly, for most everything that ails you, getting medical care or medicine is is exponentially easier and cheaper than the United States. I remember I was in India a few years ago and I was suffering through sort of Jardia type um, gastrointestinal distress. And I just suffered through it for about seven days. And then finally it's like, I can't do this. I can't just keep trying to eat rice and yogurt and hoping it'll go away. I need to get some medicine. So I went to the doctor. I, I think we're a little bit intimidated by, by uh, going to the doctor in the US because it's such a hassle and it's so expensive. So I went to the Indian doctor. This was in Pushkar, India. And, you know, of course, I'd come up with the same stomach ailment that every Western traveler does when they go through push cars. So he rolled his eyes, wrote out a prescription, and the doctor and the medicine together cost me a dollar and 65 cents. And so, um, <laughs> and, and there's parts of Asia or even Europe where if you know what, 
you know, if you know how sick you are, you can just go to the pharmacist. You don't even have to go to the doctor. You can go to the pharmacist and just ask for a certain antibiotics or certain medicines. Um, and, and especially in the developing world, often the pharmacist can help diagnose the problem. And so in medical terms, it's good if you have, you know, medicines or, or, or health supplements that you, that you use as a part of your routine, bring them with you. But unless you're in deepest, darkest Borneo or Zaire, uh, you're going to have the same pharmaceuticals by different brand names in every country you go to. Uh, and so that's encouraging. And again, even in France, I, I got really sick in France uh, about six or seven summers ago. And the doctor appointment in the medicine was about $60 US. I mean, wow. it was just so much cheaper uh, than it is here. Wow. So immediately I'm just thinking, all right, well, in America, we have some, you know, obviously we have some healthcare challenges. It would not yeah, cost yeah. $60 uh, to go. go. That, that would just be for the prescription, maybe. Yeah. Well, it's an, I mean, this is not something I'm not deeply versed in how American uh, medical care works, but I think it's like we're, we're, we're using money from pot X to pay for things in, in pot Y and it just, it's not very logical. And so there's something very rational about uh, the way you end up paying for medicine in, in these places overseas. And so in, in a way, medicine um, is the least of your worries and, and health is the least of your worries. You know, inver people invariably get traveler's diarrhea, but you just, you work your way through it. You rest, you, you eat blander foods and, and you get over it. And it's part of the travel experience. Maybe get health insurance for catastrophic um, situations. If you break your leg in the Himalayas and need a helicopter, then get insurance for those situations. But the day-to-day -day health uh, is as easy um, or um, or more than than um, it will be back home. And this actually kind of segues into the other point you brought up. Yeah, is that people think, oh my gosh, the world's so dangerous. You know, terrorists could ruin my trip. You know, ninety nine point eight percent of the time, you're not going to get encountered by you know terrorists. You know, who are going to attack your hotel, you're going to be, you're going to drink too many beers on the beach and you're going to fall off your rental motorcycle on the way home or burn your leg on the exhaust pipe or something. It's going to be just dumb, small stuff. You might get your pockets picked. In fact, you asked me about a dangerous situation. I think when you're, when you're way off the tourist trail, you're actually safer than when you're on the tourist trail. I mean, maybe the buses might be rickettier and, and you might be still subject to certain kinds of petty crime, but there's no market in in the middle of nowhere for um, robbing a tourist. You know, it's, it's where all the tourists are, which is where all the pickpockets are going to be and where all the scam artists are going to be because there's an economy uh, that has grown up around the tourist dollar in places where tourists go. If you're going to places where tourists don't go, then people will just, it comes back to that, oh, who's this, who's this American guy in my town? This, that's kind of interesting. And people will actually watch out for you, you know. If you're in a town where there's not a lot of tourists, people will say, hey, you know, this is interesting. Let's go have dinner. Don't go to this part of town. Don't go to this bar. Don't go to that place. Um, and people really do watch out for you when, when you're off the tourist trail. The one time I got drugged and robbed once, I tell the story in my second book, Marco Polo Didn't Go There. Uh, and it was in Sultan Ahmed. It was in the most touristed part of Istanbul. And it was part of a travel scam that I probably shouldn't have fallen into. Um, I should have been a little bit more suspicious about the situation. Uh, sometimes as a solo male traveler, I leave myself open to things that like females wouldn't do. Like a female would never put herself in this situation. But I just, I got a little lazy and I fell into a, a scam that if I had read seven, page 76 of The Lonely Planet in Istanbul, I would have known about. And so uh, that's one of the ironies of international travel is that we see all these, these, these panic-driven headlines. But at the end of the day, you, you're more likely to get your pocket picked in the most touristed part of a country than have anything bad in a, in a non-tourist part of the country. And odds are, if something bad happens to you, it's because you did something dumb, like not properly knowing how to ride your rental motorcycle or staying in the sun too much in a tropical region and getting a second-degree burn or something. Yeah. So uh, encouraging news. Yeah, really encouraging news. I, I think it's a big, I think it's a concern. I, you know, I, I really think it's an excuse like, oh, you know, I don't know if it's, is it safe? Is it, is it what am I going to do about medical care? So really just debunking some of those myths there. Um, I'm curious to know, like, what would you say is the difference between your first book, Vagabonding, and then your second book, Marco Polo didn't go there? Well, um, Vagabonding is long-term travel and time wealth in theory. And Marco Polo didn't go there is, is those is that lifestyle in practice. It's the stories of me on the road, actualizing my time wealth um, and having adventures. And as my 
experience in Istanbul shows, it's not all, you know, inspiration and mountaintop moments. Sometimes I got drugged and robbed. Sometimes I got sick. Sometimes I had difficult situations. But that's part of what travel has to offer you, that sometimes you are bored or lonely or lost. And you call on your own resources and you live in a way that is a lot less passive than living through your smartphone screen at home. Um, and so Marco Polo didn't go there. It illustrates you know, the, the, all the twists of travel and, and all the people you meet along the way. And then it's a little bit of a travel writing primer because after every chapter in Marco Polo didn't go there, I have end notes that talked about the decisions I made in writing it. Uh, I think people often think nonfiction writing is a matter of just writing down what you did, but there's a lot of selection and, and reduction and, and um, strategy that goes into travel writing. So uh, even though it's mainly a, a, a bit of entertainment in illustrating how the vagabonding life works, uh, it's also sort of a textbook for people who are thinking about writing their own travels. Yeah. Yeah, it's just good to clarify that on that point for the listeners interested in your books. Uh, the next thing I wanted to go into was this idea of home, of having a home on your long-term travel. So we, we spoke earlier uh, before we started the show and, and you said you're at your home now and uh, where you're from in Kansas. Now, when, when you're doing long-term travel, does the idea of home go away? Do, do you just feel like, like just nomadic, like where I am, this is my home. How does that, what happens to that idea of home? I, I think home, the concept of home transforms over the course of your travel career and the course of your life. You know, growing up, when I, when I was first thinking about vagabonding, I was still very much thinking, I considered home my childhood home. But as I traveled, home was just sort of this concept that traveled with me. You know, that I, it was almost liberating to think that I just carried a few things on my back and I could make a home or make myself comfortable in any number of places. Um, but as I insinuated before, 20 years of that can become as meaningless as rooting yourself thoughtlessly to one place as well. So uh, I began to have temporary homes, you know, living longer in Thailand, for example. I lived in New Orleans for a while. I lived in San Diego for a while. But ultimately... Um, I, actually, one of the lessons I learned from traveling the world is everybody puts a fairly high value on family. Um, and so I ultimately ended up getting land near my parents and near my sister and her family in north central Kansas. Uh, and so one benefit is that I'm close to my family. Another benefit is that uh, it, it's very inexpensive. You know, it's not as fashionable as, as living in, uh, you know, a more fashionable part of New York or San Francisco or Austin or Minneapolis, but, uh, expenses are very low. And because my family lives nearby when I'm gone, they can keep an eye on my house. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that everybody find a place on the prairie and, and, and find a home, but I think it comes out of an organic process is that some people, um, will live for five years, on, on the far stretches of the globe and then come back and create a place for themselves in the US or, or Australia or wherever they're from. Um, but I think keeping a fluid definition of home is good, especially when you're, when you're young or when you're on the front end of your travel career or, or even when you're old. I know people, I know empty nest vagabonders who um, retire early and then, damn it, they're going to move to the South Pacific and they do. Um, they're going to redefine what home is. They're not going to let home define them, but they're very much going to uh, keep home a fluid concept and, and, and again, make it inform their happiness, make it inform their best way of living. Uh, and, and often that's not even something that needs to cost that much money. One reason I um, lived in Thailand and ended up writing my book there is that it was very inexpensive. I was living on food included about $200 a month. I didn't have a lot of money, but I wasn't spending a lot of money. Uh, I was eating great food. I had beach access all the time. Uh, and that paradigm of home worked for me then. And, and now I have a very peaceful place uh, in a familiar part of Kansas, and that's working for me now. And it'll probably continue to transform over the course of my life. Yeah, yeah, that's that's big. And I, I think you probably got lifted a few eyebrows there when you said $200 a month in Thailand close to the beach. I, I think we often associate travel with being very expensive and, and uh, again, really, really sharing with us what it's really like. Um, I, and I'm sure there are expensive places uh, in Thailand, but you know, I'm sure you could also find the places that, that make sense. Yeah, you can. And, and you can really travel according to any budget. You know, I was probably... 
in my late twenties when that was happening. And now that I'm in my mid forties, I might want to live a more comfortable existence, but you know, I have more money probably than I did back then as well. <laughs> right. Right. But, but then also when I was 29, it's like there was, yeah, there was sunshine. I, I, I didn't need an extravagant place to live. I just needed my laptop. I was doing some writing. I was eating well. There was a constant rotation of travelers coming through. And so I was never, in addition to the Thai people I lived nearby, there was always German or Norwegian or American or Canadian people to hang out with. And it just made me realize that, you know, at, at home in the US, we can obsess on all of these possessions that are going to make us happy. But I had for almost nothing, I had the things that people in the U.S. dream about. I had a sunshiny beach and I had this awesome rotating social community that I had access to and I could do whatever I wanted every day. Um, and so, so that was great and that was very life specific and, and uh, it, it again goes back to that quote I started out with, not setting limits on what you can and can't do. And if, if, it's, the, if it's the sea and sand part of, of the beach scene you want, then you don't have to spend $500 uh, a day at some luxury resort in an expensive place. You just go to a, a cheaper part of the world. Um, and I, I think one thing about, one great thing about travel is that the more you travel, the better you get at it and the more information you have. And so sitting at home and, and researching places online and talking to people is one thing. But then once you intuitively know sort of how it works and what's available and that, hey, if, if, if Goa has an awesome beach, I bet Guatemala does too. Just sort of knowing that there are options that are outside of the consumer world. Um, nothing against the consumer world, but oftentimes life choices are presented to us as consumer choices that we can buy into this plan or buy into that plan. When in fact, you can just sort of go and create your own life uh, that you can that you you don't have to go through the middleman and get the uh, the thousand dollar a month beach house. You can go get the rickety beach hut for a hundred dollars a month, and and uh, it probably isn't that much different at the end of the day. So. That's another great thing is that once you once you get past the barriers and make that first trip, then your second and third and fourth and fifth trip will just be so much more richer with this wisdom that you've been accumulating. Um, and then you can have then, then your life just deepens. You become travel becomes one of your skills um, and like shooting free throws or uh, practicing anything. It's just something that you get more savvy at uh, and you, you learn to do it for personal reasons instead of just because it sounds good. You realize that it just on a very satisfying personal level, it can enhance your life in a very, in a way that's very specific to yourself. Yeah. I was doing some reading on this, uh, on you actually before the interview. And I'm pretty, pretty sure I read that you, you were traveling to multiple different countries with no backpack and, and no luggage. You, you were just, just what you had in your pockets. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I did that as a stunt. Um, I went. I decided to go around the world with no luggage, um, carrying only what was in my pockets in a, in a travel jacket that converted into a vest. And the idea, you know, I was live blogging. I had a, a cameraman. I made a series of videos uh, with me at a clothing company. Was my sponsor. Almost immediately, I adjusted. Um, after a week, it didn't seem that weird to travel with with no baggage. Um, like the first week, I, the biggest problem was just sort of thinking, oh crap, where did I put my bag? <laughs> you know, that, that old the defensiveness that you build up as someone who travels with a bag that you have to keep an eye on. Um, but then I got used to, I just washed my clothes every day, had it kept a spare set of underwear and, and t-shirts in my pockets. And um, it almost became too easy. Uh, and, and people shake their heads when, when they say that, but I think you get used to it, once you get used to traveling with a minimum of things, the world is full of all kinds of awesome things to do. You know, I, I went on safari. I, I, I went canyon swinging and zip lining in New Zealand. Um, I just did all these amazing things. Like I didn't need to drag a bunch of stuff around the world because the world gave me so many cool things to offer. And I don't know if I would always travel baggage free, um, but it goes to show that you don't have to drag a bunch of crap around you. That you, one carry-on bag can last you a long time. Just once you get into the habit of living with very, very few possessions, and and what happens is you find that experiences replace uh, possessions in a certain sense. That you're doing so much that it doesn't matter that you don't have a bunch of you know that you don't have your video game console to come home to, um, or your furniture or whatever, because you are. Because every day is so new and, and vivid, uh, and time is slowing down in the sense that that really what you bring with you is much less important than what's right before your eyes. 
Yeah. Wow. You know, that, that's just, <laughs> I, I could only imagine right there just what that would be like and uh, you know, what an experience that must have been. Um, you know, the first, you know, excuses that people probably give you is the one like the money and time. And then I think maybe the second or <laughs> third question they might ask you is, oh, well, of all the places you've been, what would you say was the most memorable place or a type of experience that you've had on your travels? Oh, man. You know, I've been traveling so long that it's hard to reduce it to just one. And, it, and in a way, it's the drugged and robbed moments that are the most memorable in a certain sense. You know? <laughs> uh, literally, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Right. Um, but, you know, I just remember there's just certain moments. It's not always bad moments, but I just remember moment like watching the sun come up in, in Florida, my very first vagabonding trip or, or, or sleeping in a meadow in Yellowstone and just feeling grateful, you know, just feeling grateful that and maybe that's specific to me is that I didn't grow up around a lot of people who traveled and it didn't seem like a, a right. It seemed more like a privilege. And so I just felt so thankful that I could find all these beautiful moments to myself. Um, and you, you develop relationships with different places. You know, I, I wrote my book in Thailand. I spent a lot of time there. I feel very comfortable there. I miss it. I just watched a documentary about the Moken Sea Gypsies in Thailand, and it just, it just gave me this ache. I just suddenly wanted to go back. Uh, it made me, made me feel bad that I was going to Uruguay instead of Thailand. But I know Thailand will be there when I'm ready to go back. Um, France, I teach a, a creative writing course in Paris every summer. And... France is a place that I went to after I'd already explored Asia. And so when I went there the first time, I thought, well, it isn't very exotic. It's, it's westernized. But Paris is just such an amazing city. And I've really, over the years, uh, developed an interesting relationship with that city. And so that's a place that I've become very close to. New York is the same way. And, uh, and so I have little places like that all over the world where I've just had these moments and really, it's, it's probably been 15 years since I've been able to pinpoint just one place uh, because there's so many that have become meaningful to me. Yeah, I, I kind of assumed you were going to go in that direction. It's, it's just too tough there. Well, okay, this has been a really good uh, interview so far. I want to take it just a few steps deeper and go into what I call the knowledge round. Just going to ask you some rapid fire questions here. So, Rolf, are you ready for the knowledge round? Sure, let's go for it. <laughs> Is it worth $10 to get the woman of your dreams? Unveiled at last, a simple proven playbook to go from being a frustrated single man to having the woman of your dreams. A proven strategy so effective that I was scared to unveil this strategy to the world. When I discovered this strategy, I was initially scared to share it with the world. I didn't want to become a dating coach and really didn't want to have the stigma associated with that. However, I knew I had to write this book. I was frustrated with all the pain I saw inside men, stopping them from getting the woman of their dreams. I'd been there, and I wish I'd known this strategy earlier. This strategy will allow even the shyest of man to find and attract the woman of their dreams. You'll learn how to turn the number one barrier stopping men from chasing the women of their dreams, fear of rejection, into your ally. You'll completely eradicate approach anxiety from your psyche forever, and most importantly, you'll acquire the number one trait that women find most attractive, a man of purpose, the grounded man. Inside this book, you won't find any fluff or any filler. I packed this book full of actionable content to help any man get the woman of their dreams. Armed with this book and the desire to change your life, nothing will stop you from going from where you are now to where you want to be in your dating life and relationships. One word of warning. Go to knowledgeformen.com slash playbook or simply go to Amazon and search for dating playbook for men. Again, that's knowledgeformen.com slash playbook or simply go to amazon.com and just search for dating playbook for men. Welcome to the Knowledge Round, where the guests will be asked rapid-fire questions to give the audience invaluable pieces of wisdom to help transform their lives, starting in three, two, one, showtime. All right. Well, what I'm noticing about uh, this this whole interview series and even having gone through vagabonding is like really having a sense of uh, purpose and, and what you wanted to do, which was travel and go be an adventurous and, and experience more of life around the world. Um, you know, what advice would you give to someone who doesn't have that sense of purpose or is feeling really lost right now in this moment? Well, uh, this might sound like a cliche, but I'd say travel. Um, obviously that's my brand, so to speak, but sometimes, uh, if you don't feel a sense of purpose, it's because the world that you have rooted yourself in isn't offering you anything novel and exciting as a sense of purpose is that you've habituated yourself to your own routine and your own, you know, received 
information that you're not excited about anything because why should you be? It's, it's other people's inspiration. It's other people's agendas. I think oftentimes it's leaving home and getting out of your habits and routines and, and you know, leaving your social media and smartphone in, 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 in a bag in a box and just going out and having raw experiences, that's a way you can find your passion. That's a way you can find your purpose. There's other ways to do it, but travel is a great proving ground for um, finding out what you love and finding out what you're passionate about. And at the very least, you've had an awesome trip. Even if you don't come home with a new sense of purpose, then you've experienced new things. So I'm a big believer, obviously, in travel as a way to not just sharpen your sense of purpose, but completely overturn all of your assumptions and really make you think about the world and your own life uh, and time in a whole new way. Yeah, I like that. Really stepping out of your comfort zone there too and uh, trying something new and, and breaking that mundane. Uh, let's let's dive into like, what would you say was, was, if anything, holding you back from becoming the man you are now today? Uh, holding me back like when I was younger? I'm um, sure like just in general, there's, there's usually something that's holding a man back from the man he wants to be and, and just wanting to see if there's anything uh, that pops out for you. It's probably a little bit generic. It's just, I think it's the, these assumptions that traveling the world or being a writer or being a person who writes books and sort of is able to reinvent himself by, you know, doing a TV series or, or working in radio is, is, is frivolous. Uh, and so I really think it was overcoming the idea that stability was, was, was a necessity uh, that, w- that, that held me back early on. And the more I tried to wrap my head around notions of stability and, and, and the right way to live and, and how um, certain kinds of security are supposed to enhance your life. I needed to let go of the idea. Again, it's, it's that comfort zone thing that, that I was talking about and that you were echoing is that your comfort zone is hard to leave. And sometimes your comfort zone is hard to identify. Um, is that your comfort zone is, is so comfortable that you, you don't even recognize it. Um, and so I think it started to multiply once I, that first step was I think that first vagabonding trip. And then the more I traveled, the more I was able to identify where, what my comfort zone was and inspire myself almost by accident sometimes to keep pushing and keep chipping away at that comfort zone. All right. Good, good. And what would you say are, you know, being a writer, this will be tough. (laughs) Uh, What would you say are two of your most influential books that you have read that have helped you on your journey and why? Wow. Um, Yeah. It's interesting how sometimes, like I quoted Walt Whitman at the outset of our interview and Leaves of Grass has to be one of the most inspirational books at a very key time in my life. I mean, it's a collection of poetry. (laughs) I mean, it's not a very practical book, but somehow it captured the spirit um, through by which I wanted to live. Just, just sort of this openness to new experience and and joyfulness at the possibility that life has. So I am a big uh, evangelist for Walt Whitman's leaves of grass. Um, And then let me think here. You know, there were writers like uh, Kurt Vonnegut and Joseph Heller, sort of humorists that I read that really helped me not be afraid to develop my own voice. I'll probably say something a little bit esoteric, but probably um, Pico Iyer's Video Night in Kathmandu was, a, was an important early model for me as a travel writer. Um, he was writing about, that book came out 25 years ago, but he was writing about travel. He was writing about Asia in a way that was just really insightful and really attuned to how the world is now as opposed to how it hypothetically was or, or, or could be. And uh, it really helped me not just understand Asia better, but to seek to write about Asia and everywhere really uh, in a way that was unique to myself and that might, you know, um, include more insight than just your average travel story. Uh, And so I think even though vagabonding is not in the mode of that book, vagabonding took a lot of inspiration from that, that philosophy that underpinned Pico Iyer's writing in Video Night in Kathmandu. Yeah, really good books. I'll have to put some of those on my wish list, check those out. And so this next one is actually more of a scenario. So Rolf, if you had 60 seconds with 20-year-old Rolf, if you can kind of picture what he was doing, where his mindset was at, where, what he was kind of thinking, 
Well, you know, what would you tell them to do and what would you tell them not to do? Well, I, I'd probably be coy just because 20 year old Rolf turned out all right. You know, I'd probably pat him on the shoulder and say he has a lot to look forward to. Um, I would probably just, I, it would fall back on these same things I've been talking about when I'm talking with you. Just don't set limits. You know, don't let people bully you into thinking that a limited version of your own life is somehow more desirable than a wide open and possibly riskier version of your life. Um, I would also say, and this is something I tell my students, waste your 20s. Your, your, your 20s are meant to be wasted. And by that, I don't mean get a dumb job or a heroin habit. I mean, try things <laughs> that, that... You got, you you got some explaining to do with this, this one right here. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Well, well, some people just, they think, waste your 20s. You know, what does that mean? I mean, you don't have to be locked into your finance job when you're 24 years old. You know, if finance calls to you, you can always come back to that. Spend your 20s doing crazy, uh, um, you know, ideally constructive things that you may have been afraid to do. Go and get your scuba certification. Teach rock climbing in Thailand. Um, go and, you know, do a ride along with the cops or, or, or work as a cop for a year or something. Just do, just get experiences because there's no place like your 20s, in part because you're young and in part because you tend to be unattached when you're young, to just try things. And, and almost never has somebody ruined their employment prospects forever by doing interesting things throughout the decade of their 20s. I think the more that you mindfully do things that you're passionate about and that sound interesting and fun and daring and even frightening, the, deep, the, the, the richer your life gets. And suddenly you're in your 30s and you have this great foundation because you took all these risks, because you followed all your passions. You may, you may have done 15 different things in your 20s, but suddenly you really know what it is that you like to do. And you really know what you're good at and you're passionate about. And it's a really more effective education than just getting a couple of graduate degrees, doing your internship and following your career. Nothing against that, but oftentimes that doesn't jibe with how people dream and how people find their happiness. Um, and so I'm in my 40s now, but man, I feel like I did a pretty good job of wasting my 20s. <laughs> um, okay. But I encourage people to do that. I, I think people in their 20s are way too tied up trying to start their lives. Um, and it's really not that big of a deal. You don't have to nail down your life's goal when you're 20s. You can wander and explore and dream a little bit. Yeah, and I'm, I'm thinking that this response here that you gave us, you know, wow, you know, really powerful and how much it relates to uh, the first question I asked you, which was about like finding your purpose and like, what should you do if you're lost? Like, I think, you know, waste, you know, don't be too hard on yourself if you don't know exactly what you want to do. And maybe what, what your purpose should be is just to go on an adventure and, and like you say, waste your 20s. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, it goes back to the, the monomyth in Joseph Tam Campbell of the young hero who travels into the world and slays the dragon and saves the maiden and then comes home a better man. I mean, the dragon and the maiden could be metaphorically any number of things. And there could be a dozen dragons and, and two dozen maidens, and they all have lessons to teach. Um, and they all carry risks, and some are going to lead to happy experiences and some sad experience. But man... What, what, a, what a way to live a life by throwing yourself into it when you're young and, and you're not exactly sure how you want things to play out. Yeah, this is really hammering home. And, and even for this next one here, if you have to summarize some of your main points, you know, that's perfectly okay. But just what would you say is your philosophy on life and success? I think, I think success is a process. Um, I, I talked to Tim Ferriss. I was on Tim Ferriss's podcast before, and we got into this interesting conversation about success management because both of us have become successful uh, relative to where we were when we started. But you still, even though your success is very goal driven, but then once you've reached a certain level of success, you have to find a way of appreciating your success. Um, and so I think success is very personally motivated, and what you think. Success means when you first set your goals, invariably changes. Uh, and then once you find your success, there's different degrees of success, but you also have to redefine what success is, learn how to appreciate what success is. I mean, I think there's a lot of billionaires in the world where they could have been happy after their first 20 million and sort of trying a different tack, but they just decided to keep doubling down on that success. And eventually, you know, the amount of money they have becomes meaningless. It just becomes monomaniacal and a little bit compulsive. Um, so I guess my advice there would be 
constantly fine tune and redefine what success is because invariably you're going to be successful at some uh, point. And then um, actualizing the, the fruits of that success depends on how you redefine your success and your goals. Um, I, I think so much of our lives when we're young are in the process of becoming, becoming who we really are, becoming someone who's aligned with our dreams. And then when we become that person, we feel very grateful, but we, we still have to live. That sense of becoming is so central that when it's gone, we redefine what success is and how to best live within what is success. So I um, hope I didn't get too Zen there, but that's sort of my thinking on it right now. <laughs> no, the more Zen, I think the better. You know, I think the more interesting the response, the better for the audience. <laughs> this this will probably be, you know, episode 210. So we've, yeah. we've heard a lot of that and that was really a unique flavor there. So that's going to conclude the knowledge around there. And, you know, you know, I'm personally, you know, I'm interested in what's exciting you now today. Like what's kind of some projects you got cooking in the oven? Like what's going on now? Well, I've, uh, I've been dabbling in screenwriting since I was in my early 20s. Um, in fact, I wrote spec screenplays for the, the company that eventually made the movie Sharknado. Um, and so that's a little footnote to my career. Uh, a B-movie company called The Asylum. And it's been fun to, to see their success, which is obviously I was never destined to become a writer of B-movies. Um, but screenwriting has always been an interesting creative pursuit. And so I'm working on a couple screenplays right now. Um, one is a historical based on a true story screenplay and one is sort of a coming of age screenplay based upon my own experiences. I also just finished a book about hip hop. It'll come out next May. Uh, and so I joke to my students that these are my midlife crisis projects. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> And uh, let's say right now, I, you know, I'm like, hey, you know, I actually own an airline. I can give you one free ticket anywhere in the world. Uh, where would you want to go? I mean, you've been so many places. Where, where would you want to go? I can get you a ticket. Wow. Um, gosh. It, it's funny. The more you travel, the more you realize where you haven't traveled yet. Wow. So, um, man, I would love to go to Antarctica. I don't know if you can land on Antarctica, so that might, uh, that might uh, be a default Maybe, maybe just Africa, maybe like a, a ticket to Cape Town. And I would love to just wander Africa for like a year. It's like a continent that I'm under traveled. This winter, I'm going to be in South America and I've spent some time there in, in, in various journeys. Uh, but once that's over, I, would, I think I would take that ticket and use it as a pretext, not to get to a single place, but to go to a continent that, where I could wander sort of on my own whim for months and months. Wow. All right. All right. Well, for all the listeners, uh, you can follow up with Rolf Potts at his website, rolfpotts.com. And that's with two T's. Just go to Google. It pops right up. It's number one. And then also go to Amazon. Just type in Rolf Potts and you'll see his books there. And uh, I highly recommend Vagabonding. I've gone through that. And uh, his, his other books that he has, I'd highly uh, check those out too. Uh, is there any other plugs that you'd like to leave for the audience on how they can follow up with you? Uh, I think, you know, my Twitter handle is at Rolf Potts. I don't tweet a whole lot. Um, my email is at rolfpotts.com. So I'm sometimes slow, but I try to respond to everybody who inquires. Uh, I have a lot of stories and links there. So rolfpotts.com and, and Vagabonding, the book, are, are both great places to start if you want to learn more. All right, Rolf, this has been a fantastic interview, uh, a little bit longer than I normally do, but you're just, you're really dropping a lot of knowledge here. So I want to keep that running, hit that, you know, let that uh, be shared with the audience and the listeners here, but it's been a really good interview. So I, you know, I really thank you for your time. You bet, Andrew. Good luck in everything. Thank you for listening to the Knowledge From It podcast. Hundreds of interviews and a million downloads later, we're continuing to build an international movement, and we've just started. So if you enjoyed this episode, go ahead and leave a review in iTunes. It really helps to grow the podcast. Guys, 2015 is the official year of living with purpose, where every day you do only the things that matter to you. You wake up, live with purpose, and take massive action towards the life you want. Check out kfmfree.com to get free tools I've created to help you crush life. Again, that's kfmfree.com. This is your host, Andrew Fairby, and I'll see you in the next episode.